All right, well, hi guys. <laughs> um, I'm Daniel Gordon, hi. Um, I'm a contractor to the Department of Defense Cybercrime Center, DC3. Welcome to my presentation on defense in depth against DDoS, against distributed denial of service attacks, and how defend, defense in depth can diminish dis, d dollars destroyed. Um, don't say that too many times fast. Uh, I was advised not to put a quote on my title slide, but I did it anyway. Um, I wanted to get out of the way why DDoS matters. Um, it is not as sexy as conventional cyber attacks, but it costs money. That's why it matters. All right, let's get started. Um, first off, I'm going to quickly whip through conventional denial of service attacks. I'm going to talk about some unconventional denial of service attacks. I'm going to talk about defensive solutions and how to evade them. Um, I'm going to talk about defense in depth some, and then if your defense in depth doesn't work, I'm going to talk about building resilience in your network and failing gracefully. I will not be talking about cat-based denial of service attacks. I just thought this comic was awesome, so I'm including it anyway. <laughs> All right, so conventional denial of service attacks. Classically, uh, TCP, UDP, ICMP, these are layer three and four protocols. Um, TCP is a stateful protocol. It requires a connection. So the way that these are typically conducted is a session is started, but then nothing happens, so it just sits there open, consuming the victim resources. UDP and ICMP are um, connection or stateless uh, protocols, which means that they are more prone to amplification attacks, where um, somebody bounces traffic off of a third party, and they're spoofing somebody, so that results in traffic being directed back to a victim. Um, these are a couple of examples of ICMP and. UDP uh, attacks, respectively. Um, Memcached has been uh, patched for the most part, so unless somebody sets up a vulnerable server, you're unlikely to see that. But these are both ways to bounce traffic off of one party and re that results in a flood back to a victim. Um, DNS and other exposed resources uh, can be targeted by conventional live service attacks. Um, it, yeah, there's no real way to prevent that except for some stuff I'll go into later. Um, botnets are another common method, the famous example being the Mirai botnet, which um, caused somewhere in the neighborhood of $110 million worth of impact to various uh, organizations um, and had the Brian Krebs website down for a little bit. Um, DDoS for Hire is uh, another classic example uh, where particularly in the gaming community, people will uh, pay somebody to knock off uh, the connection of somebody they don't like temporarily. Um, and finally, application layer attacks, so layer seven, these are uh, people attempting to use website resources uh, by um, you know, entering content into the website until uh, it's not responsive. Buffer overflows are a way to uh, consume additional resources. All right, so that's conventional denial of service attacks. Let's hop into unconventional. I wanted to talk about the China Great Cannon. Um, this is something that uh, was uh, tested live uh, in 2015 against resources belonging to an organization called greatfire.org. Um, uh, the China Great Cannon takes web requests from people outside of China to websites inside of China and injects JavaScript into their session. Um, that JavaScript causes a call to a victim website, which generates a huge flood of traffic. Um, it took down Cloud, Amazon CloudFront briefly and GitHub briefly, even though they have massive resources, uh, massive bandwidth. Um, this vulnerability still exists. Uh, ISPs are still injecting JavaScript into people's sessions. So, uh, and no matter the size of your organization, you're, you're still vulnerable to this. So it's worth your time to think about uh, being resilient to large denial of service attacks. Um, BGB hijacks are another unconventional denial of service attack. These are more commonly unintentional they are, than they are intentional, though they still do happen intentionally, uh, often due to specific countries I won't name. Um, but uh, like unintentionally, you know, 
uh, a Nigerian ISP, uh, I think last year, um, misconfigured some of the routers and ended up flooding some things or uh, basically taking down YouTube for a minute um, because you know, this is a mistake that does happen. Um, and finally, uh, not, yeah, not finally, um, authentication brute force attacks can cause a denial of service condition. Um, so be that password spraying or uh, credential stuffing, um, if they're done improperly and you're locking out accounts when people try to brute force things in the wrong way, um, this is a problem that you should uh, pay attention to. I will talk about some mitigations later. Um, DDoSes can be used to distract from or enable a, a conventional intrusion. Um, it's not something that most organizations have to think about, but if you're a Ukrainian power supplier, then maybe it's something you're aware of and uh, need to be prepared for. Um, and finally, e email DDoS services. Um, I am sure that some people here have been a victim of a reply all storm. Um, don't do it. Don't hit reply all if there are a thousand people on an email. Uh, Liam Neeson will find you. <laughs> all right. So now I've talked about unconventional denial of service attacks. Let's talk about defensive solutions. Um, for most typically, people will uh, contract with you know an, a CDN, an ISP, a cloud provider, somebody with a ton of bandwidth, and just kind of hand off this problem to them. Um, they third-party DDoS mitigations mostly work against layer three and four. Those are TCP, ICMP, UDP attacks. Um, they have some limitations, so. I think that their uh, terms and conditions may prevent you from testing your DDoS mitigations, which um, I don't like that. Uh, they may struggle with dynamic IP ranges or uh, having large IP ranges. Um, and I don't know, it's handing it off to a third party may not be the right solution to everybody. Um, WAFs, uh, web application firewalls, uh, are intended to cover that layer seven um, type of attack. Um, they do take some configuration, some setup, uh, but they will hopefully handle it. Uh, there are I've seen situations where they have missed layer seven attacks, but they do a pretty good job. Um, next gen firewalls um, are can handle some things, but they ha uh, they do packet introspection and packet correlation, which can help kind of identify uh, patterns that would identify make up a, a DDoS attack. But they have performance limitations because of what they're doing. Um, they will fail if they get too much activity. Um, it's actually documented in public now that uh, some next-gen firewalls have a specific infrastructure whitelisted. Um, I will talk about why that's a problem more later. Um, CDNs, uh, content delivery networks, are a way to host things external to your network. Um, that way, they're not subject to a potential DDoS against your network. Um, if I, I think of this in a way as kind of sharing risk, if, if you're hit by a big enough DDoS against those resources or, or uh, somebody else who's hosting stuff alongside yours gets hit, that may still impact your content. Um, they do have a lot of bandwidth, so hopefully you're fine. Um, organizations can move their services to the cloud, and traditional firewall blocks um, still have utility. Uh, and depending on how you have them implemented, can be uh, used effectively in this situation. All of these protections um, have their utility. I encourage folks to use them in combination to provide depth, defense in depth. That's, that's part of the idea is by, by themselves, any one of these is going to be s seriously limited, but together um, they can be used effectively. All right, so let's talk about evading s some of these solutions. Um, so I mentioned, uh, particularly with next-gen firewalls, if you spoof a customer or partner or user of an organization, um, they can't easily block you without also blocking their customers. So that is going to provide significant challenges to some of these uh, defensive solutions. Um, bad guys can also target unprotected intermediate infrastructure. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be a big deal to DOS a certificate authority unless you really need to update a certificate, and then it's a big deal. Um, 
Bad guys can use proxy lists, which cycles their uh, their IP address through a, a, a list of hosts. Um, they can also use carpet bombing, which spreads their activity across an IP range. Which uh, the idea behind that is to keep the uh, level of traffic on any d individual IP under the threshold of something that would trigger a DDoS mitigation. All right, so now. Um, now I've talked about uh, defensive solutions and evading them. I'm going to talk about defense in depth a bit. Uh, so I encourage organizations to make a DDoS plan um, and also test them to see if they work. T test your plan. Um, when t testing your mitigations, you should not only see if they're working, but also how quickly they, they start working. Um, if your website's down for 20 minutes before a DDoS mitigation kicks in, um, for some organizations that's unacceptable. They're going to lose lots of money, and that's not good. Um, it may also be a problem if somebody's using something that, like a proxy list that moves between a series of IP addresses. If they respond too slowly, they're not going to uh, be able to catch it in time to do anything about it. Um, all right, uh, website input validation. Uh, this should be fundamental. SQL injection still works sometimes, so clearly not everyone has figured this out, but please do it. <laughs> Block or limit the source of inbound protocols, um, such as ICMP, uh, which is, sorry, I should have explained these earlier. ICMP is used for ping stuff. DNS is used for resolving uh, domains. SSDP is uh, simple service discovery protocols used by uh, IoT devices to discover what else, or lots of things on a network like printers and fax machines and stuff, not fax machines, um, to discover what other devices are locally on a network. Um, these are commonly abused for this. Uh, so l block or limit them. Limit the source to specific IP addresses that are trusted if you can, but also uh, put in rate limits. There's no reason you need lots of ICMP traffic entering your network. Um, block, or common, uh, block common reflection uh, sources. So there are websites out there like ddsmon.net that track uh, ske sketchy infrastructure that's being used for reflection attacks. There's no reason you have to wait until you get hit before going out and blocking uh, sketchy things in China that uh, are likely to pro be used as a reflection attack. Um, and finally, uh, not finally, uh, transition to a multi-threaded IDS solution. Um, every defensive technology must fail open or fail closed if it gets too much traffic. Let me repeat that. Every defensive technology, if it gets too much sent at it, must fail open or closed. Um, if you're running a single-threaded IDS and it gets long sessions or too much activity, it will either close, causing a denial of service attack, or it will let things through. Um, the biggest example uh, of a single-threaded one that I can think of is SourceFire. Uh, I encourage folks to move to Suricata if they haven't already done so. Um, Hopefully everyone has done that, but I'm sure that there are still people out there running source fires. All right, De more defense in depth. Um, I mentioned, did I skip over something? No, I did. I didn't. Sorry. Um, I mentioned email denial of service uh, attacks earlier. Um, uh, mitigation is to implement DMARC. DMARC is a framework for auditing uh, sending rights, email sending rights from your net, your domain. Um, it makes sure that if somebody sends an email from your domain, they're allowed to do that. Um, it uses SPF and DKIM and some DNS stuff, and it requires some work, but I encourage folks to do it. Um, alternatively, move your stuff to the cloud. Um, implement CAPTCHA or password auth delays. Make it harder to brute force uh, things externally. Um, patch your IoT devices for the love of God or manage them properly. Um, IoT devices, I, yeah, I mentioned the Mirai botnet earlier. IoT devices are a frequent flyer in, uh, in terms of being used for DDoS attacks. Um, they, uh, 
they can cause a DDoS based on external traffic uh, or traffic leaving your network to DDoS other people. Um, so it's not just to be a good citizen. You should do it to protect your own network as well. Um, fingerprint authentication sources using whatever mechanism you have available. That way you can block people effectively even if they're hopping around um, trying to use different, uh, different IP addresses. You may still be able to track them using other means. All right, so now I've talked about defense in depth. I'm going to hop into building resilience. Um, first, I wanted to explain this picture. This was a flood in North Carolina where uh, lots of houses got destroyed, but there's this one beautiful house uh, that is in probably perfect condition. I don't know, maybe they got messy, but um, I encourage everyone to maintain a network map and asset inventory. Uh, you will not know that your devices are protected unless you actually know where they are. Um, people do spin up things in the cloud, set up servers on their own. Uh, if you, I encourage you to try to have a way to track that kind of activity. Um, implement network se network segmentation. So, if part of your network is down because of a DDoS attack. There's no reason your entire network needs to be down. Um, segment off some resources from your web-facing stuff. Um, diversify service providers or cloud providers if you can. Put in a load balancer if you can, if, if it makes sense. Um, these things can add overhead costs. They add effort to your uh, to maintain for your organization. But um, for for some, these will absolutely be solutions that uh, provide kind of reliability, even if Amazon or Google aren't available, which does happen. Not often, but it does happen. Um, figure out which which uh, services are critical by talking to stakeholders. I know some of you probably don't like talking to people, but it's important to actually know what things in your business or organization need to be protected and what things don't matter at all. Um, and then focus your resources on the ones that actually need protecting. Um, all right, so if you really want to be resilient, though, you should host your infrastructure on a botnet. <laughs> Just kidding, don't do that. It's illegal. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've talked about building resilience. Uh, now I'm going to talk into failing gracefully. Um, implement cloud service ceilings. Uh, I don't recommend finding out about a DDoS against your cloud resources when the bill shows up. Uh, it would be much better if you were able to uh, shut that off you know, while it's happening. Um, invest in multiple ways to talk to your customers. Uh, if you're running VoIP over the same infrastructure that is uh, hosting web services and it gets DDoSed, um, people may call you about your website being down, not get an answer. And then maybe they assume you just got went out of business or something. I don't know. Um, yes, have a way to communicate with customers, with partners, etc. Even if your primary infrastructure is under attack, um, instead of locking out accounts uh, that are being brute forced, maybe you could limit uh, what they can access to say only internal resources. Um, it's a way to uh, prevent that kind of uh, external problem that I mentioned earlier. Um, configure actionable alerts for defensive systems, even if they fail into log-only mode. Um, so even if you're getting a DDoS attack that is just absolutely creaming a next-gen firewall, if it still logs C2 activity, command and control activity from a bad guy, you want to know about that. You want to be able to act on it, even if your next-gen firewall is unhappy. Um, prioritize which events you want to hold on to, um, even if your log files have just blown up. Um, so if you get an alert for Mimi cats on your network, that's probably something you want to pay attention to, even if uh, this DDoS attack is happening at the same time. Um, and finally, uh, configure a SIM or orchestration platform so your analysts can silence things that they don't care about so that they can still do their jobs. Um, so that, uh, sorry, let me explain this picture right quick. This was uh, flight 1549 that uh, somebody, it had engine failure. They landed it successfully in the Hudson. Nobody died. 
Um, that is the best example of failing gracefully I can possibly imagine. Uh, that is amazing. All right, so this actually, that was the end of my presentation. Um, I talked about defense in depth against DDoS attacks and how it can save you money. Um, I went over DDoS attacks, talked about defensive solutions some, building resilience and failing gracefully. Um, I hope I tried to provide some practical examples that hopefully you guys can take back to your organization on Monday and uh, you know implement and use for actually protecting things. Um, I hope that provided value. And does anyone have any questions? See a hand in the back. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I can ask though. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, the question was: uh, I, Is DC three bringing back a forensic challenge? Um, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I'll ask. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, comment is that it's missed. I, uh, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Any more questions? Any comments? Okay. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it.